Um, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I welcome you uh, to this fifth edition of In Science, the biggest international. Oh, I'm going with yeah, the biggest international uh, scientific film festival of the Netherlands, and also one of the biggest of Europe. Um, my name is Marjolein Visser and I will sort of guide you through the big ideas during these festivals. And uh, uh, the big ideas are actually uh, lectures, so to speak, lecture speeches uh, from top scientists. Scientists who are uh, changing the Netherlands, the world, maybe even the universe a bit uh, by their original provoking but always emerging theories and practices. People who could actually inspire you and I um, and uh, help us, um, well, to sharpen our own thoughts and ideas. Um, we have a sort of an interactive part uh, tonight. First we will see the lecture, the speech, and then uh, you and I get the chance to ask some questions and share our opinions. Um, and uh, then we will all go our own ways, but I would also like to tell you that uh, later on tonight, uh, Jurassic Park will be shown here at 9.30. I don't know if there are people who are thinking of going to Jurassic Park. Yeah? You too? Okay, well. Yeah. It's just a, but there are still tickets available, so if other people would also like to join, uh, they, uh, they can still go. Okay. Then uh, I would uh, like to announce uh, the person who will now give the lecture. You all know her, uh, Britt Ray. Uh, she is a broadcaster and an author uh, researching emerging science tech and the ethical issues that they open up. And uh, she tells stories about what she finds via podcasting, radio, television, interactive documentary, uh, print and public speaking. She holds a PhD um, in science communication. She is a co-host of the BBC podcast Tomorrow's World and she is a TED resident. And she wrote a book. She wrote the book The Rise of the Necrofauna, the Science, Ethics and Risks of De-Extinction. That is why she is here tonight. She will tell us more about the extinction and about that wonderful book that uh, was awarded, uh, shortlisted for the Nonfiction Soroyan Prize, Lane Anderson Award, uh, the must read book of 2018, according to the Sunday Times. So we are very honored that she is here all the way from Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, Britt Ray. Thank you so much for that really kind introduction. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to this talk. Did any of you manage to see Genesis 2.0 that was played just prior? Yeah, some of you? Cool, okay, that's a healthy amount. When I first saw it, the, um, the bit at the end where they almost lose all their bounty with the tusks made me feel sick. It was such a close call, so whew, good thing they made it. Um, yeah, so I wrote this book. It deals with the real world evolution of de extinction becoming its own scientific field. And it goes beyond woolly mammoth de extinction that Genesis 2.0 peers a bit into. And so tonight, I want to shed some light on what is involved in de extinction today the science, the ethics, the risks, as this says. And the field goes by many names. Some people call it species resurrection, some people call it revivalism. My personal favorite is zombie zoology. But all of these terms are somewhat misleading, somewhat sensational, so today we'll get into the nuances of what it's really characterizing. This image is what we've got to start with, right? Because, let's be honest, Jurassic Park is what always comes to mind when we hear about bringing ex extinct species back from the dead. Um, this, of course, represents a tale of researchers setting out on a scientific and capital-driven dream to bring back the most iconic species that ever walked the Earth. And it also represents a tale of it all going terribly wrong. Because as Jeff Goldblum's character warns us in the film, when we humans act too closely on our own hubris, when we try to control life, life finds a way to break free of that grip. But I'm here to tell you, don't worry, in real life, dinosaur de-extinction is out of the picture. We're not going to be able to work on it. Although scientists have tried to salvage ancient DNA from fossilized remains or even inside the 
amber-encased insects that have sucked on dinosaur blood, as we see in the film, it's never been able to be read out afterwards because they've been gone for nearly 66 million years. This is far too long to be able to then create a genomic map of what's inside that DNA sequence. Um, it's been exposed to the elements, all these fossilized remains for all that time. And after an organism dies, when the cells go into that state of death, a natural process sets in that sets the pH off balance and then that makes enzymes run around inside the cell and start cutting up the DNA and chopping it into little bits until eventually it's like a bunch of confetti and really hard to string back together. Not only that, it's contaminated because there's bacteria and fungi and all other organisms around it. And so you can imagine after all that time, there's just nothing you can read. The oldest organism that scientists have been able to sequence some ancient DNA from was a 700,000 year old horse. And when you consider that 700,000 years is just a tiny fraction of 66 million years that the dinosaurs have been missing for, we start to understand why that will remain only in Hollywood and not in the real world of de-extinction today. In our real world of de-extinction, it looks a lot more like this than dinosaurs. So this is in fact a picture of the only de-extincted animal to have been quote unquote resurrected after the last individual of the species died. And this is a clone of Celia, who was the last Bucardo, also known as the Pyrenean Ibex, which was a type of mountain goat that lived in the Spanish Pyrenees. And although this did happen in the early 2000s, it's debatable as to whether or not it was really a success because this little clone only lived for about 10 minutes. So Celia was the last of her kind because humans hunted this species out of the wild. And she was cared for in a conservation program that had a radio collar around her neck that monitored her every move. And one day it sent out a signal that told her caretakers that something was amiss. So they rushed out into the field to see what was going on, only to find that Celia had been crushed to death by a branch that fell from a tree. So terribly unfortunate way to lose the last member of this species, right? But they had the foresight before she died to have preserved some of her cells. They scraped them off of her ear and from her flank and they froze them on liquid nitrogen so that that process I told you about where the pH changes and then the enzymes cut up the DNA would not happen. It was perfectly preserved, which meant that two years after her death, they could attempt to do something pretty unthinkable, which was to clone her back to life. And so they did this using the same technique that gave us the world's most famous adult animal clone, Dolly the Sheep, created in Scotland in 1996. And the process is called somatic cell nuclear transfer. And it involves taking a cell from the animal that you want to clone and removing the package that contains most of its DNA inside that cell called the nucleus. And in Dolly's case, that cell came from a sheep's udder, okay? And because of the udder's approximate relation to breasts, we learn why Dolly the sheep was actually named after a famous country singer with famous udders. This is not a joke. <laughs> so anyway, with Dolly the sheep, they remove this nucleus from this udder cell and they insert it into an egg cell from another sheep that's had its native nucleus removed. And then they stimulate it to start dividing with an electric shock and they insert it into a uterus of a surrogate mom where if all goes well, it grows into a clone. But science is messy. And the process is a lot stranger and full of failure than the headlines will have us know. So with Dolly the sheep, it took 277 attempts with this method to produce 29 embryos that were implanted into 13 surrogate moms to produce the one famous clone that we all know and love. Okay, well, I don't know if you love her, but I think we do, right? So let's just look at a clip from Genesis 2.0 where a for-profit dog cloning company called Suam in South Korea, which makes its money by cloning your dead dogs, if for $100,000 a pop, is giving birth through surgery to these cloned pups from the surrogate mom, just to give you a sense of the temperamentality and the invasiveness involved in this process. Oh, can we have the sound, please? Welcome. 
<laughs> Welcome to life. So cute. <laughs> so cute, yeah. <laughs> and when it's crying, it's very good news. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Who crying? Both of them. Both of them. Uh, both of them already. Uh, someday. We can get a crowd member right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. I believe. Yeah. We have to. Okay? Now, you can listen to me a little bit. Oh, it's coming out. Is it coming out? Yes. Meow, meow, meow. Kujang, meow. Hankukjang, meow. How are you, everybody? How are you? <laughs> Just had to let those puppy cries linger for a second because they get me every time. Okay, so they made it, those two puppies, thankfully, right? But you heard how uh, the doctor said that we have to get a mammoth this way, too. So what's that procedure going to look like, and who's the surrogate going to be? Right? It's going to be an elephant. And what about their endangered status as it is? Should we be subjecting elephants, their closest living relatives, to procedures like this, especially when we know how fickle it is and it doesn't just work at a first try? This involves one of the greatest ethical issues with de-extinction is that we need to recognize the animal welfare problems wrapped up in it and see that as we are trying to create life and be generative, we are also never innocent in this process and there's a destructive interplay or an economy and exchange when we're bringing extinct species, so to speak, back to life. Okay, so then perhaps it's not so surprising then that when it happened with the first extinct species, which was arguably a lot harder, because the animal to be cloned was already dead, it didn't work out so well in, in a quick manner. So 154 embryos were made with the process that I described, which then created 57 implantations in different goat mothers that then produced seven pregnancies out of which one came to turn and birthed the little clone that then died 10 minutes later because it had a lung deformity. This is massive amounts of life in the process getting caught up and at stake. Okay, so since Celia's clone died, many other de-extinction projects have gotten off the ground. The thylacine, gastric brooding frog, aurochs, passenger pigeon, there's a few that we can point to. And this is all happening at a time when scientists largely agree that we are in the sixth mass extinction. So one of these six most significant moments of species obliteration that the planet has ever seen. We know that extinction rates right now are about a thousand times higher than the normal background extinction rate says that they ought to be, and that what's unique with this moment is that it's driven by a single species, and of course that species is us. So before I go much further, I just want to get a sense of what your gut is telling you. Why do you think people are doing this? Why go to all the trouble of trying to recreate close versions of extinct species? Just a show of hands. Is it possibly because it's crazy cool and we should do it because if you can bring back a mammoth, then duh, you should do it. Few, okay, yeah, some people are wavering. Yeah, it's an uncomfortable one to totally buy into, isn't it? Uh, maybe because we feel guilty for making species go extinct. There's this kind of atonement for our ecological sins. Yeah, guilty. Or maybe because we can learn from it and we can advance science. It's all an educational process. Less, a few, yeah, okay. What about because it might be doing something beneficial for failing ecosystems? All right, so I've heard all of these reasons put forth at different moments, but the one that gets the most overarching support by the scientists at the helm of these projects is this last one. And so the idea is that de-extinction can be used for ecological restoration, because if there's a species that had a particularly significant role to play in an ecosystem that has disappeared, 
We think of these species as keystone species, um, and we can create an animal that can then look, act, live out that ecosystem role in that environment and reintroduce them into that ecosystem, then we can build back some of the productivity that's been lost since that animal went extinct there. So an example of how this is working in de-extinction comes with the species of the passenger pigeon. So this is the most populous avian species that humans ever interacted with. It's dramatic in terms of the records we have. Flocks of billions would darken the sky, sometimes for up to 14 hours at a time as a single flock would be passing overhead. If you shot a bullet upwards, you could see anywhere between 25 and 100 birds rain down because they were layered that thick as they flew. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's mythic proportion here. And we thought they tasted good. They were a very easy to catch and cheap source of protein. We would go into their colonies and smoke them out and then salt them, preserve them, put them in barrels and ship them out on rail lines to the big cities in North America where they would then be served to people. And we apparently thought that the young fattiest squabs tasted the best. And so remarkably, they went from billions to none in a short amount of time until one day in 1914, the last passenger pigeon named Martha, after George Washington's wife for some reason, died in the Cincinnati Zoo. So they've been missing for just over 100 years. And they used to live in the eastern forests of North America. And in those forests today, we have a generally closed canopy system. So the branches and trees are nicely interlaced, meaning that it's thick, dense foliage that kind of blocks the sun's light and energy from penetrating the forest floor. And so it's not that rich in the undergrowth. But back in the day when you'd have hundreds of millions of birds landing to uh, roost and nest, the sheer weight of them would cause branches to crack and fall over and they would scratch bark off. They would be a forest disturbance. And this would then break down the canopy, allow sunlight in. Sunlight energy would penetrate the forest floor. It would grow rich in interactions between flora and fauna and all the rest of it until it eventually grew back thick enough that the canopy was starting to close again, but then the following year the birds come back, break it all down, nice regenerative cycle. And forests depend on disturbances in order to cycle through generations, you know, hailstorms, fires, tornadoes, these things are natural and they're also sometimes simulated by us in order to get them to become a successional forest. So those who want passenger pigeon de-extinction say that we should get them back into those forests in order to do this in a more admirable and advisable way than simulating those kinds of disturbances without the birds. Okay, so picture this. At the young age of 13, there was a boy named Ben Novak who learned about passenger pigeons for the first time when he was reading a book this is not actually him, this is uh, the boy from The Never Ending Story, which is another one of my favorite films, so that's why I put it in the Red Film Festival, but it gets the point across. Uh, he was a huge Tolkien fan at that age. His head was always in fantasy books, and for the first time he learned that this bird, which sounded like a thing of fantasy because of how many there were, was actually not fictional, it was something real, it was something that humans saw with their own two eyes and killed with their own two hands, and so this broke his heart. And he set his life's goal at that young age to bring the bird back to life. And remarkably, today he's my age, and he is the lead scientist on a project called The Great Comeback of the Passenger Pigeon, funded by an organization devoted to de-extinction and genetic rescue of endangered species using biotech tools called Revive and Restore. Okay, so since 2012, he's been working towards this project goal in different universities in California and where he is in Australia now. And this is me with some of the preserved birds at the Royal Ontario Museum in my hometown of Toronto where they have the world's largest collection of preserved passenger pigeons. Um, and it's from this very batch that some of his colleagues took a little pinch of the toe of one of these preserved birds off to sequence the DNA and get some of the first genomic maps to do the de-extinction work that he needs. Um, and then this has been showing up to one of our many Skype interviews in a pigeon mask because he is that zealous about the bird. He writes poetry about it. He paints in its plumage color palette. He is definitely the right man for this job. And this project depends upon a gene editing tool called CRISPR. How many people in here are now familiar with CRISPR? Many folks, yeah, because, you know, it's being talked about kind of endlessly. It's the blockbuster biotech tool of the century, so they say, and it's a naturally occurring defense system and bacteria and archaea that 
to help them defend themselves against viral infections because they can recognize DNA and chop it up to deactivate the infection. And since 2012, we've become increasingly sophisticated at learning how to program the system to cut up and change DNA, not just in viruses, but in all kinds of living platforms, in bacteria, in plants, in animals, in humans, it's working. And we're getting um, closer to making it do very, very finite and precise changes that include writing in new genetic code where we want it to. So a crude metaphor that's helpful for thinking about it is that it's basically a Swiss Army knife for DNA that has a magnifying glass that allows you to scan the genome for the right place to cut in that genetic sequence. And then the blades are the scissors to make that cut and then a pencil to write in the new genetic code where you want it to. So in this way, when Ben is trying to recreate the passenger pigeon, he needs to start with some kind of living cell that he can use CRISPR on. And to state the obvious, there are no passenger pigeons left since they're extinct. Therefore, he goes to their closest living relative, and that's something called the band-tailed pigeon. And he compares the genomes, the full readout of the maps of their genetic material between the extinct bird and the living bird. And he looks for where they're similar and where they're different. And he knows that where they're different, that's going to be where the genetic mutations lie that are responsible for making the passenger pigeon a unique kind of bird that is different from the living band-tailed pigeon. And eventually he'll identify the genetic changes that are important for um, editing into the living bird cells to nudge it towards becoming like the extinct passenger pigeon. So genetic variations that will code for the right coloration and tail shape, for example. And he'll take these gene editing tools, CRISPR, and go into the cells from the living bird that will become sperm and eggs. They're called primordial germ cells. And he makes CRISPR edits in these cells that will become reproductive cells until he's made enough changes that he's satisfied that he could produce a bird that will look and be able to act like the band-tailed pigeon. And then when, I'm sorry, the passenger pigeon, the extinct bird. And then when the band-tailed pigeon lays an egg, this embryo at a certain time that it comes out, he hijacks it and using a glass capillary needle, he injects these cells that will become sperm and eggs that he's edited into that developing bird. And it's traveling then through the circulatory system of that developing bird and it, these cells nestle in that bird's gonads. Eventually it hatches into a bird that looks exactly like the band-tailed pigeon, which is really weird because he's done all this fancy gene editing work that's super cumbersome, so why would it look like the same bird we already have alive today? The thing is that that bird has a secret in its gonads. It's effectively carrying passenger pigeons, sperm, and eggs. So by the time that that generation of modified birds grows up, becomes sexually mature, and then crossed, mated with each other, the birds that they give rise to should be the passenger pigeon reborn in terms of the looks expressing the genetic changes that he gave it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so eventually he wants to make enough birds that he can test how these flocks behave in nature. With controlled settings, he can then see how, how are they interacting with predators, with pathogens, with food sources. And then if that all goes well, he'll start flying them between different test sites. And if that all goes well, then he'll just release them completely when they are in large enough flocks to have the ecosystem role that he wants them to in eastern North America. So it's a very long process over many years. But those forests have changed, of course, since the passenger pigeon has gone extinct. Um, there's a lot of development. It's a densely populated area. How will humans living nearby feel about the skies possibly being darkened if they ever should be one day by these recreated, highly genetically modified passenger pigeons brought back from the dead? How will they feel about all of the droppings on their windshield that were not formerly there? These are questions that uh, need to be thought about well ahead and consulted with communities, of course. Um, not only that, many ecologists say that it's kind of an anti-ecological argument to propose that this could work to regenerate the forests in a way that mimics the way they used to be because it's not as though the forests have just been sitting on standby since the bird disappeared. They've been adapting to their disappearance. And so adding a bunch of birds back in that are like the passenger pigeon may well send the forest into a new tertiary state, a novel encounter for the forest that the world has never seen before. And that's why some scientists say that this is really a thing of fantasy to imagine that it'll work in that proposed way. 
which is interesting because the fantasy writer George R. R. Martin has personally donated to the passenger pigeon's return. It captures hearts and minds. Okay, so another ambitious project that we need to talk about is the Woolly Mammoth Revival. If you saw Genesis 2.0, you'll know that there are different approaches to doing this. There's one team in South uh, Korea using cloning, and then here at Harvard, George Church um, is approaching it again with CRISPR, with a gene editing um, strategy. And so their goal is not to recreate a, an identical copy of the woolly mammoth, but to create a hybrid between their closest living relative, which is the Asian elephant, and woolly mammoths by introducing specific woolly mammoth genetic changes into Asian elephant cells that will cause an elephant to have necessary traits that will make it cold tolerant so that it can live in the ecosystems that mammoths used to roam around in, like the Yukon in Canada and Siberia. So these are traits like, um, of course, the iconic shaggy mane and smaller ears that allow less heat to escape in cold environments and thicker, fattier, insulating skin, and crucially, the ability to bind and release oxygen in its blood in freezing temperatures. And so he's already made many, many edits to Asian elephant cells and is testing how they express in those cells. And the hope is that eventually they'll make all these edits consecutively in a master cell, so in an Asian elephant embryo, and then implant it to grow. So let's just take a look again uh, at the film to see a clip of the inside of the lab where George Church and his postdoc, Bobby Dadwar, who's done most of the CRISPRing work on these cells so far, are just contextualizing the work that they do. Dear Maxim, we are shooting at Harvard Medical School in Boston a building dedicated to futuristic sciences like the genetic resurrection of the woody mammoth. And guess who's the head and initiator of this crazy plan? Judge Church. He wants to bring a woolly mammoth-like elephant back to life out of a petri dish. Now these are cells that we transfected the other day about 50 edits we're transfected about uh, 10,000 uh, Asian elephant cells and we see this variation and they've been treated with um, Bobby Dadwar, a researcher successfully edited 50 mutations into elephant cells Church does not want to clone a mammoth he wants to create a new animal a hybrid a cold-resistant elephant with mammoth features, a chimera, no. like the Zors. Phenotypically, they look so different. Yeah. The Asian, well, the Asian the already mammoth. has smaller ears than the African, right. but still even smaller. Watching the two scientists playing God by creating a new animal, I'm at the same time fascinated, frightened, and a little bit disappointed. Asian elephants will play in the snow. Church is not bringing a real woolly mammoth back. Although he certainly has the beard to act like the Almighty. Okay, so let's imagine that they succeed sometime soon. Oh, we're going to take some questions afterwards if you could hang into it. Oh, yeah. Would we be able to switch off the lights, Franz? in the audience. Is that a little better for you? No difference yet. Feel free to yell out what is comfortable for you. I think he can hear you. This is good? Okay, this is great. Thank you so much, Franz. Great. Um, okay, so let's, let's imagine that they're successful with getting all of those edits that they want into the embryo. Where is it going to grow? Are they going to use a surrogate mom elephant? Well, they've said no. They believe that that's unethical because elephants are endangered and their uteruses should be freed up to create more elephants rather than these experimental animals from their lab. And so instead, they're concurrently developing artificial womb technology to be able to gestate the growing, developing woolly mammoth, elephant hybrids, mammontelephus, you might want to call it, all sorts of new names I'm sure will come to the fore once they get to that stage. And so this is a picture of a functioning artificial womb that has been 
um, growing a developing lamb for several weeks project. But why go to all the trouble of this? Why invent new technologies? Why do what previously seemed inconceivable? The ecosystem role, what is it that they want the woolly mammoth to do out in the wild? The answer has to do with the climate crisis that we're currently in, which we know is getting worse. So back in um, the former habitat of the woolly mammoth, places like Siberia, there are enormous swaths of land con constituted of permafrost. And this permafrost contains a lot of carbon materials. So animals that have lived there over millennia and died and fallen into the ground, and even more significantly, the vegetation that's there. So as permafrost is now warming because of climate change, we're learning it's not really permanently frozen like the name suggests. It's thawing, and as it thaws, it releases these carbon contents out into the atmosphere, which get uh, emitted as carbon dioxide or methane, two of the greenhouse gases that, of course, have us in the warming cycle in the first place. And this creates a vicious feedback loop whereby the more that these greenhouse gases are being emitted by the permafrost, the more it warms up the permafrost and thaws more, and then there's more emissions, and on and on we go. And it's believed that there's twice as much carbon trapped up in the world's permafrost right now than there is already currently in the atmosphere that is causing the warming effects. So scientists are desperate to come up with innovative ways to keep the carbon locked up in these frozen soils. And if you think of what the habitat is like today, for much of the year, it's covered by a thick blanket of snow. And blankets are insulating. They keep things warmer than they otherwise would be. So the idea here is that if you could get giant marauding heavy beasts, woolly mammoths, walking around, punching holes in the snow with their big mammoth feet as they're looking for a blade of grass in the winter months to eat and turning over the snow, you're actually creating perforations in that insulating blanket that then act as ventilating holes that allow frigid cold air from the atmosphere to tunnel down and then hit the topsoil and allow cycling of cooler air, which will hopefully affect temperature change. And um, there are preliminary studies to show that indeed massive trampling of hoofed animals in a concentrated area in this habitat will cause a fairly significant temperature change. But the idea here is that mammoths become the ultimate way to engineer that change because not only do they trample, but they are, um, these hybrids are of course highly related to elephants we know elephants are very aggressive. They hope that these mammoth-elephant hybrids would also be very aggressive and thereby knock over thick, dark trunks of trees that otherwise absorb the sun's heat because dark things absorb heat, and that their dung would fertilize lighter grasses that are reflective of the sun's energy back up into the atmosphere. That would start to collectively make that entire swath of the mammoth steppe ecosystem turned back into something more like what it was during the Pleistocene when mammoths were here. Okay, so we see woolly mammoths kind of double dip with the methodologies. We've got some people trying cloning, we've got other people trying gene editing, um, but there's a third method of de-extinction that we haven't yet talked about, and that is a much simpler one called Backbreeding, and it's actually um, interesting that we're here to talk about it in the Netherlands because there have been um, years of backbreeding projects right here in this country to try and recreate the extinct ancestor of all today's living cattle called the aurochs or the uros. Has anyone heard of this going on in the Netherlands? Yeah, heck cattle, things like this. Okay, so you'll probably know then that it's um, it's a form of artificial selection or br selective breeding techniques that um, basically go for skin deep de-extinction. So similar to the ways that we bred dogs from wolves um, through selective breeding over generations, here you're selectively breeding animals that we have available to arrive at an aesthetic of an extinct animal that's no longer here. And the reason this can work with something like the aurochs is because we know that all of today's living cattle descended from this type of cow that went extinct in the 1600s. So although it's not here, its genome is presumably here on Earth, just scattered and diluted and sprinkled across all of the cattle that we have access to. So what you do if you want to get the aurochs back through backbreeding is you identify cattle breeds that have the right characteristics that remind you of the aurochs. So things like the right horn shape, the right coloration, the right differences between males and females, the right body size, etc. And then you mate these lines together over successive generations until you start to sharpen the form of the type of cow that you want to get. And 
because that is basically showing you that it's skin deep de-extinction, it's the premise that if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's a good enough duck or aurochs as the case may be, we see that this is not um, identical creation of extinct species. And it doesn't just pertain to backbreeding, it's also the case for cloning and gene editing that we're never gonna get the original back. And this is really the biggest misconception about de-extinction, which is important to highlight that Extinction is still forever. Extinction is still the tenet of conservation, the thing that we want to prevent, and it needs to stay that way. In no way can we undo the erasure of an entire way of life and you know, millions of years of evolution. Instead, what we can do is cobble together bits of species in a new animal that resemble it, sometimes to more close degrees and sometimes to more distant degrees, depending on the method used. So with cloning, as I mentioned, the package with most of the DNA from the animal to get cloned is used and then put into an egg cell from another host animal. But that egg cell has in its cellular jelly these little things called mitochondria sitting in it, and mitochondria also have their own genomes. So although most of the genome is coming from the animal you want to clone because it's in the nucleus, there's a different genetic construct there sitting in the cellular jelly of that egg cell, meaning that there's some kind of ontological difference. We don't know how significant that mismatch in the DNA is, if it's gonna be incompatible or not when you're trying to clone the whole animal, but the fact is you can't say it's the exact same as the extinct species. Not only that, when you're going to then um, develop that embryo in a surrogate mother of a living species or in an artificial womb, that introduces all kinds of hormonal and microbial interactions to that developing animal that again the extinct animal never had because of course the moms aren't available from that species to use in our experiments today. And then, of course, gene editing, we see it's not about creating 100% of the genetic changes with CRISPR in the living genome. It's just grabbing the ones that you think are important to make a good enough replica and hybrid of the extinct species in the closest living relative's genome. So, in all cases, we're really involved in the creation of proxies or facsimiles, so close versions of the species that inspires us to do de-extinction in the first place. Okay, so I've now, from writing my book, talked to hundreds of people about de-extinction, and I can tell you that no one just feels meh, like blasé about it. People are fired up, they have very different ideas and opinions, and often they're in contrast with one another, and that's really what makes it so fascinating as a controversial field of changing science. But um, I'll just highlight a few of the different sentiments. So this is uh, Stuart Brand, he is a famous tech visionary, um, and also the co-founder of Revive and Restore, that nonprofit dedicated to de-extinction I mentioned. And he says that all you can do with extinction is just grieve. If the animal's gone, it's gone. But if the technology is at a particular point where that kind of species can be brought back, then you want to bear down and make it happen. Don't mourn, organize. So he's using his labor leader's commands to say, we need to get pragmatic in the sixth mass extinction, we need to harness our tools, do whatever we can, make whatever difference, it doesn't matter. Don't stop and feel sad, just move on it. Now, in direct opposition to this, the environmental philosopher Thomas Van Doren points out that mourning is vital. So he says, through mourning, we come to understand that something about the world we inhabited is gone, and that if we're going to go on, we must ourselves change. In the absence of mourning, we miss those opportunities for deep reflective work as individuals and as a culture about how we might go on more ethically. So the idea that we shouldn't mourn but should just do something is really worrying. Technical intervention is offered as an alternative. Instead of mourning, I think it gives us too much of an easy way out. In other words, it's a quick techno fix, a band-aid solution, not addressing the underlying problems that are causing the extinctions in the first place, and it will thus, at the end, all be for naught. We need to change the deep structural problems that are causing the extinction. Now, George Church, who you'll imagine is pro-de-extinction since he's doing it with mammoths, uh, he says a lot of the value is in the narratives and the storytelling and the public support that it can galvanize. There's all the benefits of revitalizing the conservation movement by the injection of new hope and new technologies. Conservation is worse than a zero-sum game. It's a steadily declining game. It's a very demoralizing attitude for which there's now an alternative. So can we flip the script on the idea that conservation is just constantly the most depressing field because more and more species are being lost? Will this inspire uh, 
young kids to grow up and go into science with a new attitude towards what conservation looks like for their futures. It's kind of the cultural production around the culture of the science that also gets brought up here. And uh, just another example, the woolly mammoth paleogeneticist Hendrik Poinar says that his nightmare scenario for de-extinction will be if we ever bring back target species so that people can pay money to visit them in a zoo. And he should know that this is not just a trope from Jurassic Park, but it's something that he himself has even had encounters with. A few years ago, he was invited out for lunch by a businessman, which included the uncorking of a $700 bottle of wine. And the man offered to buy him out of his tenure track academic position at McMaster University to join him in his mission to de-extinct the woolly mammoth and populate a theme park north of Toronto with these animals that families could then go visit on the weekend. And needless to say, Hendrick turned the man down, but he uses it now as a cautionary tale, you know? People have ideas about how to use these technologies that there are no regulations in place necessarily to preclude us from using, even though the scientists working on these projects don't have this in mind themselves. And because of the really high degree of genetic manipulation that will be used in most of these cases to de-extinct these animals, in the eyes of the law, it's very likely that they will not be considered products of nature, which has bearings on whether or not they're going to be patentable. In a country like the United States, you cannot patent a product of nature, but if there's a clear inventive step, then you can patent the organism and thereby you know, restrict who's able to sell it or produce it or import it and whatever. Um, but if you were in Canada, where I come from, we can't patent so-called higher organisms, which is kind of an antiquated term to talk about more complex life forms. So though a mammoth could be made and patented in the States, if it's crossing over the border and coming up to cat Canada, then all of a sudden the patent doesn't hold. But we don't yet know because the law works by precedent and there aren't yet precedents set exactly for how this is going to turn out. But it raises some interesting questions. I mean, I've had a disturbing amount of people tell me that they would love to eat a salted mammoth leg as charcuterie. And there are foodies that are pretty serious about having exotic meals, right? And what would be more exotic than meat that could be marketed as being brought back from the dead? Um, we know that some people eat critically endangered animals because it brings them status, such as the giant salamander, which a police chief in China was caught eating not too long ago, you know. Um, when something can draw attention, gain status, show how much money you have, there's a chance that we might want to be eating it sometimes. And well, we know that these species, when they're first created, are going to be very vulnerable. There's not going to be a huge herd or flock of them. They're going to basically be endangered species that need a lot of management. And we know from history that protecting endangered species doesn't actually stop us from eating them at the same time. So if we look at the story of the American bison in the 19th century, at a certain point, they're just hanging, hanging on by a thin thread. They almost went extinct. And then through some great concerted efforts, they were bred back in a lot of breeding programs and they now run around many national parks. But at the same time, there have always been populations bred just to become bison burgers that are regularly served every day in restaurants around the world. So might we end up in this kind of situation? This is a question probed by the artist think tank called the Center for Genomic Gastronomy. They interrogate human food systems and how they interact with biotechnologies. And in one of their projects called the De-Extinction Deli, they create these, uh, you know, dinners and also um, exhibition formats where you can come and uh, consider, would you eat some of these species if they're brought back to life? It's a question asked from a cultural and artistic perspective rather than a scientific perspective um, because these questions are, are very uncomfortable. Uh, we don't like to acknowledge that our ancestors actually ate some of these species completely to extinction like the passenger pigeon. And so they ask, is it, is it true that we've really changed so much that we wouldn't run the risk of doing it again? So because of questions like this, um, when I called up Stuart Pym, who's a world-renowned conservation biologist, to get his thoughts on de-extinction, he said immediately with scorn in his voice, I'm terribly disappointed that you are writing a book on de-extinction. Because he thinks that it's 
dangerous to get the public used to this idea that it might actually work um, because it introduces for him an enormous moral hazard, which is that it could set the sentiment that we don't need to really care as much about endangered species now because if they go extinct, we can always bring them back at a more opportune time. And he's seen this happen before, when the world's first endangered animal was cloned, Noah the Gore, in the early 2000s, critics of the Endangered Species Act said exactly this. Let's overhaul the Endangered Species Act, like hack out enormous bits of it, because we don't need to con be concerned as we see the science is there, we can just clone them back to life when it's more convenient for us. And we can use the habitats that are otherwise necessary for their survival in the ways that we want right now. But how do we even choose which candidates to pick for de-extinction when 99.9% .9 of all organisms that have lived on Earth are already extinct? You know, we've got umpteen choices because biodiversity is one hell of a thing. There's been a lot of life that's passed through this planet. Um, we see in conservation that we have a huge taxonomic bias. We tend to really care and have compassion for and galvanize support around saving you know, beautiful birds or these majestic mammals that look back at us with faces and eyes that we might recognize as having some kind of intelligence that speak to us in our, our human ways. And so that means that we leave out so much of life that does not have those characteristics, like the invertebrates of the planet, but these Octopi Wall Street activists will have you know that they are 97% of biodiversity today and they are not heartless, they're just spineless, so we need to care about them too. And this is really the relationship that we're already in with animals. We have a bunch of perverse incentives kind of riddling through our emotional responses to conservation that will be pouring into de-extinction too that we need to have our eye on. And so will we just create what the futurist Alex Steffen calls charismatic necrofauna? You know, the dead animals with the most charisma that make us somehow feel good about bringing them back while we don't really mind forgetting the annals of extinction filled with all sorts of other non-charismatic species. Wouldn't you say that maybe we're doing that now? We're talking about passenger pigeons, thylacines, woolly mammoths. I mean, there's nothing there resembling a snake or a creepy crawly insect. But there have been guidelines written on how to do this wisely, which is a great thing. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature has written these guidelines. They've said, you know, whether or not we like it, de extinction's coming down the pipe, so let's apply the knowledge that we have from existing conservation practices so that we can guide it in, in the best way. And they've created this kind of tier of scrutiny that if you're considering an animal for de extinction, you can pass it through this, this system, this list, and, and it asks you questions such as Is there available habitat for the species to go back into? Because if the whole point is ecological restoration, you'd better be sure that that habitat will be able to support them and also at this day and age, isn't subject to massive change from the climate crisis in the coming um, decades, for example? Are there available food resources for these animals? Are there going to be any pathogens there that threaten it? Will it become invasive and harm other species in its midst? Lots and lots of questions that tests need to be run on in order to get the answers. So, for example, is it really the time right now to de-extinct the gastric brooding frog, which scientists in Australia have been trying to clone for the last several years, which is an amazing creature, guaranteed, because look, I mean, it could create this incredible switch between its stomach and the uterus, and it barfed up its young, as you see here. I mean, it's incredible. I understand why we want this back. But it went extinct in the 1980s. And the thing that wiped it out is a fungus called chytrid, which is still here and wiping out amphibians around the world. So should we really be pursuing this when chytrid is around? Will this not create a paradigm when species can go extinct a second time, so to speak? Or could living species that are already available and here do the job just as well? Do we really need woolly mammoths to be the best ultimate engineer of those um, thawing permafrost, or could we use available animals like reindeer and muskox and wapiti and horses? And then there's all sorts of other legal conundrums. I mean, I mentioned a couple earlier with patenting, but here we need to know, are they going to be seen as genetically modified organisms in the eyes of the law? Because then other um, 
legislations come in to really govern what we can do with genetically modified organisms, like the Cartagena Protocol, which basically controls how genetically modified organisms can cross borders. So if they are deemed to be genetically modified organisms in one country and a, a herd of some kind of de-extincted creature gets released, of course they don't carry passports, so they can just like wander into another country. And if the country that originally released them doesn't have the permission of the neighboring country to have these GMOs enter into their land, that violates the Cartagena Protocol. And then all of a sudden you could really have a pickle because you've got these genetically modified organisms that are basically endangered species because they're not yet naturalized, moving into a place where there's a warden saying, hold on, do I have to protect this species because it's an endangered species or do I have to exterminate it on the spot because it's seen as an invasive GMO? This hasn't yet been enshrined in law, we don't know. Okay, so as you can see, I really like the questions without the easy answers about why this is ethically complex, but there are many benefits to this work being done in de-extinction that can spill over to help endangered species that we need to shine some light on. And this is what I really think is the, the meat of the value that all of this work is creating for conservation in a genuine manner. So one example is that um, from the de-extinction work being done at George Church's lab at Harvard, uh, a new project to help endangered elephants has gotten off the ground using CRISPR techniques that recognizes the greatest killer of elephants in the wild and in captivity, which is a virus called EEHV. And by the time that this viral infection is noticeable to a human caretaker, it's always too late for the elephants because their internal organs have started bleeding so much that the elephant's gonna die in just a few days. And it's, it's terrible, it's, it's a massive problem. And so the same researchers are now working on a CRISPR system that can hone in on the EEHV virus and deploy the, the blades, the molecular scissors to chop it up and stop that infection before the animal gets to that stage when the human notices it and then it's simply too late. So that's, that's a great thing. But what about other endangered species? How can we use these biotech tools to help them? Well, one big issue is the lack of genetic diversity in certain populations, such as black-footed ferrets. Of all the black-footed ferrets we have alive on the Earth today, they all descended from only seven founders, so seven individuals, which means they're mightily inbred. They have all sorts of problems. They have a really hard time reproducing. So the idea here is to go into the frozen banks that have samples of long-dead ferrets at a time before a genetic bottleneck event occurred that cut, cut down their numbers, creating only those seven from which all now descend, and editing in some of that genetic variation from more biodiverse ferrets into the living population today. This is something that many scientists are hopeful about right now. What about white nose syndrome? We know that bats are being decimated by this syndrome um, in caves all over North America. It's essentially a fungus that burrows into their faces and their wings when they're hibernating, and it forces them to wake up and expend energy that uh, they don't have because they haven't finished their hibernation process, and then that kills them. And so the idea here is, can we use gene editing tools to go into their genomes and tweak their genes so that they become resistant to that fungus? Another hopeful confluence of synthetic biology with conservation biology that de-extinction has really put on the map. And lastly, you know, with climate change, there's a lot of talk about the perilous state of coral reefs. The international government toll panel on climate change has told us that at two degrees warming, we can expect 99.9% .9 of coral reefs to go extinct from coral bleaching. With the warming waters, they bleach, which leads to their death. And of course, this means the loss of one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet, only rivaling the rainforest, and the loss of the livelihoods of a good half billion people living in coastal communities who rely on coastal um, reefs. So now scientists are studying um, the much rarer bleaching resistant corals that are out there to understand the molecular basis, the gene expression that allows them to withstand these warming temperatures and not bleach. And then the idea is that they can breed and outcrop and genetically engineer new corals that have those same genetic changes that will cause the expression for the kinds of heat shock proteins and other things that will help them withstand the warming waters that we expect to be getting more severe becoming more of a perilous danger to the coral reefs. So, pretty exciting, I think, in terms of how there's spillover to still present species that we know have ecosystems available to them, habitats, because they didn't disappear 
far too many tens of thousands of years ago, like some of the other candidate species we're talking about with de-extinction. And that's why I think it's just, we, we can't simply say de-extinction is good or de-extinction is bad. It's far more complicated than that. And there's fascinating issues that we need to pay attention to, be aware of as it develops in society. And we will expect that things won't always turn out as planned in these kinds of risky endeavors with living systems and the ways that we're intervening directly in their evolution right now, especially in this sixth mass extinction moment. But there's a lot of hope to be garnered at the same time. And you know, it's not the amount of species being worked on in this relatively fringe area of science that is so striking about de-extinction. It's really how well above its weight it really punches in terms of these social and ethical and legal cultural questions that it creates. So thank you so much for letting me tell you about a few of them tonight. And if you're ever curious, there's way more in my book. Thank you. All right. So now you and I have the chance to ask some questions. Please Great. have, a, thank have you. a seat. I will first ask some questions, and then I will give you the chance to also ask questions or give opinions. And But first of all, I thought maybe it is nice to know with what kind of group we are uh, tonight. So just to give an idea, who of you already uh, knew Brit Ray before tonight or knew her work already? Sure. Yep. Okay, almost now. So a lot of new... Oh, I forgot to look. Did anyone know me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two people. Cool. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> All right. So also just uh, who, who of you is studying or working something that has to do with genetic modification? All right. A few. Who of you is a scientist? Yeah, also a few. Any of you is here for personal reasons, just uh, maybe thinking, well, this is just so interesting. I want to know more about it. I watched a lot of, yeah, oh, of course, cool. a nice. lot of people. Wow, that's really nice. I think we have a very diverse group, um, and I think we should benefit of that diversity. So whatever your background is, please feel free to ask whatever you want to ask for personal or professional or rational reasons. Yeah. Just uh, get it across. All right. So, um, Ritter, of course, I am very pleased for a lot of reasons uh, that you are here. Uh, but I also, I would like to point out, um, because I uh, presented uh, big ideas this year and last year as well, and you're actually the first woman uh, here to present a, a big idea. And um, well, that's really cool. Honored to be. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's it's great to have you. And I will right away ask something about this book, the Rise of the Necrofauna, which has actually a foreword by the guy we just saw, uh, who is uh, called George Church, as you all know. So he's the professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, where his lab is trying to create a ho holy mammoth-like species. Uh, using gene editing techniques and he wrote the foreword of your book and mm -hmm. I was wondering why did you ask him someone who is working on something that you are actually criticizing yeah I, I asked him because I wanted my readers to be able to see you know from the mouth of the most influential inventor of genetic technologies who's working in this space why he's motivated to do this why he thinks this is a good idea. The motives to me are always the most fascinating. I'm interested in science as a culture more than just you know a, a, a rational practice of knowledge production. And so I like to humanize it. I like to know who the characters are that are going through these, um, these efforts, these feats, these incredible circumstances to face strange consequences and challenges along the way. And I thought he embodied that very well because he does, you know, he's well aware of the criticism. He's also very open to dialogue and debate, which I respect about him mm -hmm. um, because he does a lot of uh, genetic work in, in various other fields, human medicine too, that people uh, are constantly raising ethical questions around. And I thought that he would be able to, um, you know, set the scene that then, of course, becomes complexified if you get past the forward and you read my writing about it. Yes. Um, and I didn't know what he was going to write. And I didn't know if he would say yes, you know, because he's yeah. kind of, in my eyes, a very busy scientist. But yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he was super open to it, and uh, I was just appreciative. Yeah, and yeah. he totally went for it, and he said um, about, 
about you that there are a few of the issues that Ray explores in this timely and thought-provoking book, a beacon of discussion worthy science at the interface with peculiar policy issues. And I thought it is nice, but it's also a bit vague, just between you and me and us. Mm. What do you think that he thinks of your critical, nuanced book <laughs> while he is doing something to... I've right. never spoken with him about what he really thinks, but when I read that quote, I was like, oh, that's a polite way of saying this book's messed up. <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. I mean, I think he, he sees that I'm very critical and yeah. thinking about why uh, it would be worth reading, even though I don't agree with, with him and I don't kind of mm -hmm. get out there to champion his efforts in the book. And I think it was his um, nice and kind of reserved way of saying check it out, but without giving a glowing review. All right, yeah. so it's like, uh, if you can beat them, join them some, somehow sort of thing, maybe. Or just general open-mindedness, you know? Yeah. I think he's aware of how provocative his work is for people, and yes. that he can't shut it down. He can't only um, be uh, cheerleading for it when there's so many delicate issues involved. I think he's well aware of that, yeah. Right, right. When I read, uh, when I, uh, did not yet read your book, but first read the abstract. Then I thought, well, wow, this is very interesting. I suppose, uh, you know, that would be giving all these questions about what, what would this do to us as human beings? You know, the, the bringing back uh, these species and all these things about the extinction and what could it, you know, mean for our world, our planet? And I was really surprised about you are that the fact that you are stressing the animal welfare mm. as much and you also did that in your presentation you know the things that you told about dolly the sheep and to me it seems that you want to show us the failures that we don't hear about in mm -hmm. the media yeah but can you elaborate a bit on that why is it so important to uh, bring uh, the animal welfare mm. to the fore in this question. Yeah, I mean, I was really invested in trying to highlight as many ethical issues as I could find in de-extinction. Mm. I saw immediately that it was rife with them, and I wanted to give them all their due time. But they become very clear when you're looking at animal welfare issues. Because um, we, we tend to narrativize de-extinction as though we are making up for the holes that we ourselves as humans have reaped in nature yeah. as we've, you know, gone on living in these just destructive ways, of course, looking at uh, nature as something that we can capitalize off of, benefit from, and then take as we like. And here, all of a sudden, we have something to atone for our sins for. It's this moral practice yes. of harnessing our technologies to be pragmatic about correcting that fraught relationship with nature. Right. But if we're only talking about it in those terms, we are not recognizing that we're also causing harm to nature in the process. We're, we're still responsible and culpable and never yes. innocent in our relationships with animals. Um, and for it's too convenient for us to always brush that under the table. And mm -hmm. also, just paying attention to my own reactions. I mean, when I learned that it took that many attempts with Dolly the Sheep, I was kind of shocked. I didn't know that. Yeah. No one had ever written about it in that sense um, no. from any Two, of the news 280, 80 attempts 77, or 77, I believe. 80, 80, 80, 77 yeah. attempts. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. And of course, this is um, common in, in lab practices with animals. But I think it's an important part of the story just to show that de-extinction is not this panacea that comes in and like corrects our relationship to nature. Right. It's still something that has an economy between, as I mentioned, like destruction of life and creation of life, although yes. they might not be in equal measure. In other words, what you said was that we, we do not see these animals anymore as products of nature but they are somehow uh, um, a procession of, well, of whom actually? I wanted to ask you because the theme of this festival is who's in charge, you know, who's deciding in mm. genetic modification. And if it were up to you, you know, who should decide what we should do with these animals and what kind of animals or if at all we should bring back animals to life, you know, would that be if it were up to you, animal activists or public life, should we all decide about it in referenda, or political parties, scientists? What do you think? Who should be in charge? Yeah, it's always such a tricky question, isn't it? Because it's, in my dream world, we would all be weighing in on the debate. You know, all of us are stakeholders. We're all part of nature. We all have relationship to animals. We all... Um, invest in, in our, our relationships to animals in different ways and we'll benefit from them yeah. and uh, take advantage of them in different ways. And it would be 
good for us to be able to come together in some kind of consensus making process, but we don't have the infrastructure for that. We don't even have the infrastructure for that figured out on human gene editing, you know, with CRISPR. We're no. talking about making permanent changes to the human germline right now, our shared genetic inheritance, and we are struggling to find out how to bring the right stakeholders together to talk about something as fundamental to all of us, let alone the more curious and um, obscure project of bringing extinct species back to life, which far fewer of us are paying attention to. So I, I won't say everyone, even though I would like to, because um, I just don't think it's realistic. Mm -hmm. But um, I do certainly see that it needs to be a, a multidisciplinary conversation with scientists of all different stripes, social scientists, anthropologists, ethicists, natural scientists, synthetic biologists, lawmakers, um, policy makers, having these informed discussions and following these kinds of guidelines that I referred to with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, like understanding best practices based on where we've been in the science of conservation to date to try and do this wisely with the least amount of harm done. And so um, I think we need to have processes where we can listen to each other and not just have unidirectional transfer of information from experts to you mm -hmm. know, the public about what's gonna happen. We should listen. Um, it's a slow process and we're still, I think, um, trying to find the right systems to do that. Yes. Yeah. Well, so it's also about involving different people and different groups of, because I, because something that interests me about what you do is that I told about, to my family about the, all the big ideas that I was going to moderate. And um, um, in my family, they don't have um, a, a, that much of a high education level. And um, a lot of them said, okay, well, this is very complicated. Okay, this other science is very complicated. And I talked about you and they said, well, that's actually very interesting. And we watched the talk and said, oh, it's so interesting and what she says about mm -hmm. that. And then I thought, and also when you say this now, I think maybe you do that on purpose, that you try to reach a broader audience, not only a scientific audience. Is that something you Definitely. do on purpose? Yeah, that's important to me. Um, I think science belongs to everyone and science is a huge presentation problem. It, it always has in terms of its jargon and its inaccessible frameworks and um, there's so many things we can do to break it down, make it more accessible, make it more compelling, use storytelling, humanize it, you know, sh yes. show people how it plugs into their own lives regardless of their, their training in science at all. Yeah. Yes. Is that why in your book you also use like, uh, you use opinions, you use interviews, you use all these different forms of getting your point across? And in real life, of course, you are also in podcasts, but also on television, on radio, you do all this interactive documentary different ways of uh, reaching out to people. Yeah, exactly. It's just, um, there's, it's a really fertile time to be in storytelling or science broadcasting. I mean, there's so many formats, it's changing quickly. Um, but the, the real driving force doesn't really change depending on which method you're using. You're trying to find fascinating characters um, going through incredible experiences with uh, intriguing consequences to be able to tell a story that has a kind of arc. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I'm going after something scientific, I'm trying to always highlight the humans that I can then package that scientific information through their, through their stories in order to get it across. All right. Yeah. Okay, speaking of accessibility, uh, just um, I would like to ask, is there a question from the audience? Yes. Please speak up a bit. Cool. Uh, but that brings Yes. <laughs> so the question is, will they be able uh, to survive, right? Yeah, and, and the, 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 the Exactly. Yeah, just being born like that. What do you, 
What do you think? That's a fantastic question. It's a really important point, and it's one of the first criticisms that came out when the field was declaring that it would do this from ecologists saying, wait a second, you're trying to create an animal that would carry out the ecosystem role, right? So it needs to be behaviorally in sync with what that extinct animal did. How on earth is it going to learn to mimic those behaviors when there's no member of that species to teach it? The answer is that it's going to have to be a compromise. You're going to have to use a surrogate species, like a close species that is not the exact same, that will be able to hopefully rub off on that animal and teach it how to do its thing. But this doesn't always go as planned. It's highly complicated. Sometimes humans try to do the training themselves, but they can imprint their own human behaviors on the species, which then compromises their ability to live out those roles in the wild. You try to mitigate that, reduce that. So um, in the case of woolly mammoth cloning projects, they want to use elephants. Um, the woolly mammoth gene editing projects, they're not using elephants if it works out because they want to use an artificial womb, but will they use elephants as surrogates to train um, these species? Well, Maybe, but will it even be good enough? Because will that elephant know how to mimic the roles of the, the mammoth? Um, at a certain point, then you can fudge the goal and say, well, we don't really want to create identical mammoths anyway. We want to create cold tolerant elephants. So as long as they can learn from elephants how to be elephant-like, but then can survive in cold environments, then that's a good enough job. So we see again how we're really doing something new. We're not getting the original back. We're kind of fudging the system to create this this hybrid that will have new behaviors and as long as it can then live in that environment, it will be a satisfying enough job. Um, but the question still remains, will an elephant accept a funny looking, you know, it's like an elephant with a bad wig on that comes out. <laughs> so are they going to say welcome? They're, they are um, uh, maternal creatures, uh, matriarchal creatures, they're very close, they're emotionally bound up with one another, and we don't know because this hasn't happened yet if that highly social animal is going to be accepted into the, the herd or if it will be ostracized and then left to leave, live a, a life of loneliness when it's a, it needs to be with its matriarchal structure in order to live well. So these are the kinds of questions that also are being thought about with de-extinction and there's no easy answers yet because we haven't really gotten there. But great question, yeah. yeah. Another question, yeah, there. Yeah. So, so what are the motives of George Church and, uh, well, is he really uh, saying also what he, well, yeah, so what he does? Yeah, um, it's, so it's a really interesting thing to point out because uh, George Church is extremely optimistic in his science and, um, you know, he, he has a lot of genetic technological prowess and he can certainly get a lot of things done that many other researchers can't but still he says you know we should start with a herd of about 80,000 of these recreated mammoth elephant hybrids and put them into Pleistocene Park which is an actual cordoned off area run by these Russian scientists in Siberia that have agreed to take whatever hybrid mammoth that he makes um, but will it be fast enough to actually have the intended ecosystem engineering effect when this thawing is already underway, things are getting warmer, you know, we're expecting that it's going to be a completely different scenario in 10 years compared to it is how it is today in terms of the amount of thaw, so 
is it a disingenuous argument, essentially, to say that we should make these animals and put them back into that environment? Personally, yes, I think that, that it's, it is a little bit disingenuous because if we really um, want to focus on mitigating that thaw as quickly as possible, then we need to intr introduce all the animals that are currently available and aren't going to take all of this time to engineer and rear and make sure that they're doing things safely and put them back. So that means we need to be using the musk ox and the wapiti and the horses and the reindeer and all of that and get that trampling action going because we already have preliminary test results to show that trampling from available animals will create some desirable temperature change. But that doesn't preclude George's project from then adding in beneficially later. So I think if, if there's kind of a dual approach where they start with the available animals and then he still wants to bring in his engineered creatures to kind of make the job more effective, then they work together towards that goal a bit more sincerely. Um, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. He says he's serious about this, so I will take him at his word. Um, but for me, when I think about the project, I think it needs to be reframed for effectiveness because of how dire the climate emergency is right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You. No, yeah. With the girls. The failed draw problem? Support the hypothesis, yeah? yeah. Okay, so how to reframe this question, I'm thinking. So, yeah, what if the mm. experiment fails? All right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. I yes. see, yes. So how do we deal with the problem that we only, yeah, only the successful ones that are really showing something great and big get published and, well, and you as a PhD holder in science communication, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> I lied about my results. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, I mean, I, that's, that's interesting because if you are not willing to publish your results because it doesn't line up with your hypothesis, then I think you really need to ask yourself, are you truly doing science? <laughs> you need to be, um, you know, free from the bias of what the results are going to end up as. So it's just as valid to get the scientific outcome proving yourself wrong, what you thought maybe would have been the case. And it's interesting that you raise that because, um, yeah, that, that does make sense that there, there are publications that get lost in history that don't come out into the public because it doesn't support the hypothesis that some people want them to have. Um, but in my experience, I've seen many, many researchers publish um, their surprising results, their failures, essentially, because we learn just as much from those as we do from the ones that go in the ways that perhaps we're hoping to, to make a name for ourselves or contribute to the science in a particular way. In, um, in de-extinction, I, I think maybe what you're talking about also relates to the problem just in science communication and not, not publication because um, we need to sell stories. 
we need to, you know, compete in this whirlwind environment of there being so much content out there and have a catchy headline or, you know, a great intro to a film or like a stunning beginning of a podcast that will make you sit down and listen. And so it's pretty boring to say, hey, uh, in this really <laughs> kind of complex way, this bit failed, this bit failed, and this, we contextually learned this as a result of this not turning out in the way that we expected. And you know, we need to compete for attention and editors will only commission certain things from us science communicators that are going to be gripping and compelling and, and capture audience eyeballs uh, at this stage, um, which, which is just not well lined up with what you point out, which is that science is a messy process, a lot of it is based on failure, all of those results are valid, um, we learn just as much from them, but the science communicators don't pick those up and then run with them, which then changes the public perception of what science even is and how it's done. Does, does that line up with what you were asking? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand at the beginning, but it... Yeah, yeah, I do, well, just to plug a company that is not mine. Um, <laughs> there's a science communication publication online called Massive Science, and this was actually one of their whole intentions when they started to, to produce different articles written by scientists. They wanted to change the tone for the public about what, what is involved in the scientific process. They wanted to show the, the complicated, kind of drawn out reality of what it means to come to some of these scientific findings by not omitting all of that as kind of artifactual noise of doing science, but include it in the storytelling and training scientists how to write, but the real process of coming into their research findings, um, making space for all of that failure and all of that process in a way that the public would want to read. So I don't know if they're doing it perfectly, but they're doing um, something different there with their methods to try and really engage scientists to tell those stories that honor that process. Um, so if you're interested in that, check it out, Massive Science. All right, we have time only for two more Short questions or short answers. Um, let's Sorry. see. It's I no no. It's it's good. It's good. Just to know where we stand. Good. Good. Um, Thanks. Yes, you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Mhm. Mm So I haven't heard of any... Maybe let's repeat it oh, shortly yeah. for the people in the back. So it's about shouldn't we better, couldn't we better use artificial intelligence, for example, robots instead of real, trying to get real animals back to, back to life. I think it's I think it's a clear question. So yeah, it yeah it is clear totally. Um, so I haven't heard of anybody thinking about AI and robots to to get in there. But what people have done already is use army tanks f yeah, I about that. for the same process. <laughs> so it's just you know so Russian. yes. <laughs> 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 well, it is Russian scientists who have been using army tanks to, um, you know, start this. They, um, a man by the name of Sergei Zimov, who runs Pleistocene Park, says that he's playing mammoth when he goes out on his tank. And, yes, and tries to, you know, create the disturbances that a woolly mammoth would do. But, of course, tanks run on gas. You know, um, so, it, <laughs> and do, how do we get um, tanks that don't require humans, you're talking about robots and, and solar panels. I mean, that's a lot of technology development. It's expensive. People are going to have to monitor it. When we're trying to restore an ecosystem that has a conservation ethic to it, it's really attractive to use um, naturally regenerating organisms, you know, that can eventually manage themselves and reproduce forward successionally through generations. And I think 
they do want to keep it towards those more natural um, processes that don't then further exacerbate the kind of energy use problems that we're already having. Um, but, you know, maybe some people would love the idea that you're suggesting. I'm, I'm not really sure. It's, it's an interesting open question. Yeah. So far, it's only been tanks, though. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Final question from the audience. Yes, you, sir. Right. Yeah. All right. 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 Yes. Yeah. But how do you get at certain points the feedback of the public? How do you get the feedback? How do you get the feedback of the public? Yeah, there are, there are many methods. So um, you mentioned surveys. There, there are organizations that exist just to get public opinion on controversial scientific issues, if whether it's AI, climate change, something like gene drives, de-extinction, human gene editing. Um, but that kind of gets a superficial response because you're only questioning at one specific moment in time. You don't get to see durationally how thoughts develop over time. Um, so some people go deeper and they host what you might think of as a citizen jury where you get um, people who are coming together over many different um, dates to really talk about deeper feelings and opinions and beliefs and attitudes as it relates to a controversial issue like de-extinction and then that qualitative data is taken back and analyzed by researchers who are trying to really come up with findings around what the public thinks. These are more expensive processes but there, there are whole fleets of people who are professionals at doing public engagement that are trying to find more and more democratic ways to get different stakeholders to, to share their opinions and really listen to one another that could then um, have those lessons be distilled and isolated and used to inform the next steps of the scientific or policy development. So actually the Netherlands is a pretty cool country for looking at some of the models of that because you have institutes like the Rattenau Institute that does these kinds of public engagement projects and uses creative and innovative formats, whether it's film nights or, you know, um, art exhibitions, a variety of different things that get people thinking about the topics um, who don't have those scientific expertise and then probing them later for what they really thought about it. So um, there are many formats, it's just that we don't have a standardized kind of global consortium for gathering this information. We're still doing it in bits and pieces. It would be nice and more effective, I think. We could figure out models that we could all kind of lean into and use when we're trying to do these decision-making processes that have governmental implication. Yeah. Right. Final question. Okay. Uh, we talked about uh, the science ethics and the risks of the de-extinction in a very nuanced way. Uh, but anyway, I would still like to ask you, just let's imagine that we will be here in 50 years with this group, you and I. Where do you hope that we stand then, you know, concerning de-extinction? Do you... Did we go either, did we proceed, did we go any further to the world of George Church or not at all? What do you, if it were up to you? If it were up to me, we would be focusing on using these biotech tools that we're getting better and better at using um, to focus on the endangered species that we know still have a viable habitat because they're not completely gone yet and they could really benefit right now from a genetic boost into their biodiversity, their gene pools, their genes could be tweaked to make them resistant to some kind of pathogen that's wiping them out, whatever the case may be. I do think we need to focus on the animals that are still here first and foremost. And if we're gonna talk about de-extinction, then I don't make a separation between the animals that are still here and the animals that may have gone extinct a week ago. It's not like that makes them illegitimate contenders, but we just need to be wise and honest about those biotic factors they need. 
are they going to be th in threat of going extinct a second time because there's no food or there's humans who want to, you know, profit off of them in unecological ways or the thing that originally made them go extinct is still there. Or there's no habitat. We just, if we can be honest about um, the situation being feasible for their de-extinction or their so-called genetic rescue because they're not actually extinct, they're just suffering and they're almost extinct, then I'm, I'm for it in a, in a methodical and caring process. But flashy projects just to be the first scientist to bring an extinct species back to life, I, I hope we don't go down that route. Yeah. Britt Ray.